Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 17 of Goldendale Observations, coming to you live from the glorious new Goldendale Observatory State Park. I'm Troy Carpenter, and I'm the administrator here. I've been here for almost eight years now. And uh, we're going to talk about telescopes tonight. Now, telescopes would, would seem to be a common topic of conversation at an observatory, or at least you would think. But I've made a discovery. People don't care. A lot of our visitors come here wanting to learn what we see with telescopes. They want to look through telescopes. They want to understand the discoveries that have been made thanks to telescopes. But they're not interested in the telescopes themselves. Now, of course, I'm not speaking for all our visitors. Some of them do care about this. But apparently a lot don't. So uh, sorry if you're coming here tonight interested in the things we look at. We're going to be talking about the instruments instead. I hope it doesn't offend you. Now, a little bit different. Uh, unlike uh, previous shows, this is actually a topic that might affect you directly if you are in the market for a telescope because even though we tend to talk about big science here and, and giant super telescopes including our own tonight the topic will definitely wander around within the consumer market of, of scopes and optics uh, on that subject if you're thinking of buying a telescope uh, this might be a good moment to pay attention ask some questions not only are we going to talk about telescopes themselves, we're also going to talk about the mounts that they ride on, because if you can't point your telescope at things and keep them in the eyepiece, well, what good is it? Yeah. So, um, where to begin? Uh, before I, I'm going to, I'm going to continue trying this, this, this tradition of starting with questions. I will uh, begin by informing you of a space event occurring early morning on Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday, what would that be? The 23rd? Um, you're going to have a conjunction of Saturn and Mercury. Now, you might recall there was a great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter not that long ago, but now the the planet Saturn and Jupiter have moved past the Sun from our perspective. They're on the other side of it, so to speak, and as a result, they appear in the early morning. So yeah, on Tuesday morning, there should be a conjunction of Saturn and Mercury, um, and it will be difficult to spot them because they will be low in the horizon right before sunrise, so it'll be tricky, but if you can make them out, that'll be something worthwhile. So I bring that up because a lot of times people ask questions about current events and what they might see in the sky at a given time. Anyway, let's get to it, down to it. Let's see, any questions? Let's start, with a, let's start with a question and then we'll move on to the main topic. I don't see a lot of activity. Let's see what our metrics are like right now. Oh, there's 30 of you right now. It's not a lot, but it's enough to ask questions. I'm, I'm going to wait. I'm not going to start talking until I hear at least one question. It doesn't have to be related to this, it could be anything. Go ahead, this is your chance. Oh, by the way, I'm going to use a lot of props tonight. We'll be talking about different telescope types. Anybody? The chat is so quiet. Oh my goodness. Hold that thought. I'm going to try something. Nope. I want to make sure I'm not missing some of the chat. I don't appear to be. Perseverance. Oh, yeah, 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 that's a great thing to bring up. Thank you. So, if you guys missed it, this week, uh, NASA once again pulled off an extraordinary feat, landing a car-sized rover on the surface of Mars. And uh, what's so astonishing is the method in which they landed it. And it's, it's one they used back in 2012 with the Curiosity rover. It sounds so crazy. And yet it works. And they've done it twice now. Essentially, the rover is too big and heavy to land via more traditional means. For example, dropping it inside of a giant inflatable balloon or letting it land directly via parachutes or its own retro rockets. Too risky. You could clobber it, destroy the probe, so, or rover rather. So what they instead designed was a, a, a literally a hovering sky crane that enters... The Martian atmosphere slows down with a parachute, but because the Martian atmosphere is so thin, a parachute won't do enough uh, decelerating that you need to find another method. So the sky crane slows itself down with retro rockets, then hovers above the Martian surface and lowers the rover via cables. This is why they call it the sky crane. Imagine that. It's incredible to, to understand that that, that that operation is conducted autonomously because at the distance Mars is, the signal delay is too great to coordinate that, that series of events. They can't tell it when to, for example, lower the rover. All that has to be done autonomously. The rover, the, the lander and rover, and the sky crane, so to speak, 
are autonomous. They are robots with brains, so to speak, that are able to make decisions on the fly based on radar, based on camera inputs, and actually pull off that complex series of maneuvers on their own. Pretty amazing. Uh, so on that, since you brought it up, I think I have a picture handy. If I don't find it quickly, I'll, I'll uh, give up. But I think I have... Oh, yeah, hold that thought. I think I do have a picture of the rovers. Yes, good. So check it out. So this is to scale. And this is kind of an old picture. We see uh, two of the older rovers that are still up there, uh, and uh, including Sojourner there, Pathfinder. And uh, we see two NASA scientists standing next to Curiosity. And uh, Curiosity is the one that I mentioned earlier was landed in 2012. Look at the size of that thing. And imagine landing another one, because Perse Perseverance is very much like Curiosity, by the method I described with a hovering sky crane. What, a, what an achievement. We have a cheap telescope from all... Oh, I'm reading, I'm reading uh, questions now. We have a cheap telescope from the Aldi grocery store. It's probably 15 years old. We love it, but looking at the moon is too bright. <gasps> is there a gel filter or something we can use? Hmm. Well, yeah. Uh, you can get what's called a moon filter, although I recommend a neutral density filter or a variable density filter where you actually can turn two polarized glass elements and customize the brightness. Uh, that's an interesting problem to have. It's, 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 by the way, it's a good problem to have when a telescope is collecting too much light because we'll talk about that during the show. Collecting light is what you're trying to do, and very rarely does an astronomer have the luxury of too much light. Usually we have the opposite problem, not enough light, and we have to find all sorts of creative means to collect more. That's actually a good segue into what we're going to talk about. Did you get your ticket to Mars? I am not, I don't want to sound like a fuddy-duddy, but I'm not really interested in going to Mars. It is a dreadful place. Uh, the deadly cosmic radiation, which is ever-present, means that you have to live underground. The journey there also entails exposure to unsafe levels of cosmic radiation. It's almost a guarantee that going to Mars will entail shortening one's lifespan, uh, voluntarily, of course, uh, because of the radiation exposure. And then once you're there, it's not exactly, uh, not exactly luxurious uh, living. It's, uh, you're going to be in a small, confined space, uh, contrived environment, surrounded by instant death, jeopardy at every turn. I'm not that adventurous, maybe when I was younger, but I will say this. If I had the opportunity, I would go to Earth's moon. Although it has the same dangers, it is much closer, which makes the trip feel a bit safer. You can get there in a few days versus a few months. And most exciting for me, I would love to be able to look at the Earth from the moon. I think that would be very exciting. Uh, if you're on, on Mars, you know, Earth would appear as a, as a speck, as Carl Sagan loves to say, the, the pale blue dot. And you wouldn't see any detail unless you, put a, uh, if you, unless you looked at the Earth with a telescope. And even then, it would look pretty tiny, and it would be hard to tease out any details. Yeah, so... No, I didn't buy a ticket, to, or I didn't, I didn't uh, reserve my ticket to Mars. Sorry to disappoint you. Uh, I will tell you, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I think it's a deep topic. This is a lovely planet we have here. We, we live on a, a paradise of, of worlds. We don't know of a nicer planet than Earth. I'm sure there are some out there, but we don't know of them yet. Um, so we live on a world that we have evolved to match. It is, it is true that we are explicitly Earthlings, and so I think, I think this is a plenty fine place to hang out and uh, learn to do better on. Um, I think that'll be the challenge of the next century is humans learning how to live on Earth, live well, and also not wreck the place. We have plenty of time to go to Mars. It's not going anywhere. There is no cataclysm approaching that could render Earth less hab habitable than Mars. And that includes things like doomsday asteroids and comets and nuclear wars and all these things. Nothing that could happen to Earth plausibly in the next several million or hundreds of millions of years could make our planet a worse place than Mars. So I don't personally feel a, a rush to get there. I know some of us do, and I'm not attacking those folks, but I am not among their ranks. Speaking of uh, Mars again, back to this picture, um, it's neat to think that these man-made robots are roaming around on Mars, or if they have died, at least sitting on Mars, becoming a sort of instant memorial. I don't, I don't have any trouble with exploring the solar system with robots. They're, they're very good at it, apparently. And also, it's a lot safer if something bad happens, and bad things do happen. Uh, at least a robot blew up, and no people had to be in, imperiled. So that's my rant for the night. Thanks for asking. Agreed. That's good. Yes. So um, let's get to it and down to it. Telescopes. Uh, you might look at Mars through a telescope. 
and you might be disappointed by how fuzzy it looks because you're looking through Earth's atmosphere at a relatively tiny object. Mars is hard to observe, even with really nice telescopes, because of that pesky atmosphere. And we've talked about that in a few other shows that might come up tonight. As we get near the end of the show, I might discuss some exotic types of telescopes, and some of them include means of solving the atmosphere problem. Yeah. Okay. So, where to begin? Let me put up a picture of our old telescope. This is... Oops, hold that thought. Let me get my system going first. That was dumb. All right, as I was saying, this is a picture of our old telescope before we converted it to a Newtonian. We'll talk about what that means during this show. It was, for most of its existence, what's known as a classical Cassegrain. We'll talk about what that means as well, It's the type of telescope. We're going to talk about types of telescopes tonight, but we're also going to talk a little bit about photography. Uh, some of the sciences of photography, some of the disciplines in photography and the nomenclatures in photography are very helpful when explaining how telescopes work. Uh, astronomy and photography work together very closely. Uh, photography is very important in astronomy. We don't use telescopes to enjoy the, the sky anymore. We don't just look through telescopes and draw pictures. Scientists haven't done that for a very long time. In, in fact, imaging is absolutely critical. And so photography science evolves with astronomy and vice versa. The two, again, are deeply linked. And I found that when describing telescope concepts, it helps to invoke photography because there are far more photographers than there are astronomers. There are far more cameras than there are telescopes. These are not unrelated topics because a camera lens is literally a refracting telescope marketed differently. So for example, this is a 250 millimeter telephoto lens. I think you can see my eyeball there, that's, that's cool. <laughs> this uh, 250 millimeter lens, as it is marketed, is simply a 250 millimeter telescope, a refracting telescope that is sold to people who want to use it, not to look through, but to take pictures. Again, the concepts are the same. So on that topic, I already briefly mentioned something about telescopes that sometimes surprises people. They don't need to be used by people, and they don't need to have a, a, what's known as an eyepiece. So like I said, I'm starting with photography, so let me show you a funny picture. How many of you have seen this? What is going on in this picture? What is, what, is, what is this? This is, by the way, this is a modern photograph. They still make these things. But what's going on here? What is, what is, someone describe this picture for me in the chat, please. What do, you, what do you perceive here? Anyone know what's going on in this picture? Is this guy just a weirdo hanging out in a park with a, with a blanket on his head, or is he perhaps doing something very deliberate there? Anyone have an answer? Nobody? Are we having that chat delay again tonight like we did before? He is focusing the image. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And he's, what's he looking at? Does anybody know? Here's the mystery a lot of people don't know. They don't know what he's looking at. Human hiding in the... Oh, I like that. Human hiding in the dark. Okay, so he's, he's under that blanket because he needs darkness. A camera with no viewfinder. Oh, I like that. It does have something, though. It has a piece of ground glass. So this is a real picture of what a, a, a photographer might be looking at. Notice it's upside down. We'll talk about that in a minute. The, this is a piece of frosted glass, and an image is being projected onto it by the camera lens. Like someone said, there is no viewfinder. Now, this is a two-dimensional plate of glass, and we're forming an image. When it's time to take the picture, the photographer will insert the negative, the, which could be a glass plate or a metal plate treated with chemicals, and he will pull off a, a block, a, a cover, I forget what they call it, a, a sliding mechanism that will expose that chemical coating to the light that is being focused on the glass plate. Essentially, this works because the glass plate is occupying the same spot that the film will, so he knows that if it's focused on the glass plate, it will also be focused on the film. There really is no difference here between uh, the camera lens and a telescope lens, and the ability of these apparatuses to produce an image on a two-dimensional surface. By the way, the surface does not have, does not have to be two-dimensional, but it tends to be when it comes to the gadgets that we invent attempting to take advantage of this technology. So here's me doing the same thing with a different uh, material. So this is me holding a piece of cardboard with a white plastic coating. This is actually a, the lid off of a three-ring binder. And I'm holding it up above a telescope that has no eyepiece in it. 
Remember, I'm going to repeat that. This telescope has no eyepiece, and yet it is successfully forming an image, in this case, of the sun and also the tree. Now, I could change the focus by moving that piece of cardboard back and forth. So, as you can see in this image, I have the sun out of focus, and I have the tree in focus. If you think it's dangerous to do this, it, it is. I wouldn't recommend pointing a telescope at the sun if you don't know what you're doing or, or if you don't have filtration. But I should point out that you might be able to tell from the image. It was extremely cloudy and hazy, and so the sun was very dim by comparison to normal clear skies. So, anyway, what I'm trying to point out here is that a telescope does not require... First of all, a human operator to do something it does not require an eyepiece to make it work. So speaking of eyepieces, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, this is an example of a telescope eyepiece. This is one. This is an inch and a quarter size eyepiece, and its focal length is, what is it? I should know that. 17 millimeters. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. But yeah, this eyepiece is only a device one would use if one intends to look through a telescope. And I repeat. Telescope does not need a human to do that. I've discovered it's worthwhile to talk about this because a lot of people seem to think that telescopes only exist so that people can look through them. So that this is a visual instrument. Visual astronomy may be a fun hobby for people, but it's not science anymore. There are very few scientific experiments one can conduct using one's own eyeball and a telescope. Unless maybe you're trying to learn how to teach astronomy or share it with others, public astronomy, so to speak. So, uh, yeah. That's a good segue. I just held up a type of telescope. Let me go back to my big head here for a second. Who could tell me what kind of telescope this is? It's the kind of telescope one often thinks of when they hear the word telescope. Anybody know? I'm going to let... Oh, someone said astrophotography. That's, that's something that we do a lot of. That's right. So can, and let me give you a better example. Here's a bigger one. Right there. Where are you guys? Oh, there you are. Yes. I can see you clearly. No. This is uh, the same kind of telescope. Does anyone here know what? Okay, that's good. Does anyone? Oh, good. Refractor. Refractor, good. Refractors are the type of telescope most people think of when they hear the word telescope. The reasons for this are many. I, I assume it's because they're the oldest type of telescopes. They were invented way back in 1608 or thereabouts, probably by a Dutch guy named Hans Lippershey. I say probably because in those days, a lot of people were trying to do clever things, but not everyone was successful in publishing their work, for example. And not everybody was good at popularizing things. On the subject of popularizing things, a much more famous fellow by the name of Galileo, the next year, inspired by Mr. Lippershey's invention, made his own refracting telescope. And he achieved roughly a magnification of 25x with it. And he won all sorts of uh, accolades with the royal family and whatnot. He was, a, he was a, a popular guy after he did that. Galileo, his contribution was not the invention of the telescope, but the popularization of telescopes for astronomy, look, using them to look at the sky and learn things about it. Galileo sold books of his, his illustrations. Uh, he had very impressively detailed images of the craters of the moon, something that nobody had ever seen before. Nobody had ever seen the, the moon magnified before. So that was a big deal. He drew pictures of the phases of Venus. He, he drew pictures of the, the, the rings of Saturn, although he thought they were ears. He thought they were structures that were stuck to the side of Saturn. But he did all that using a refractor. Now, before I continue... Oh, someone now. Someone in the in the chat says refractors have a lens in front. Yeah, they have at least one lens in the front. Let's see if I can. Yeah, that's that's you can see the shininess there. I say at least one. We'll talk. We'll talk about why there might be more in a minute. Now, the ones I'm holding in my hands have eyepieces, and those are there for human operation. Because indeed, the first telescopes were used for looking for through. They were not used for photography because photography was not a thing yet. But the size of this one is actually rather compact. Galileo's was actually pretty long. It was longer than this one. And the length has some impact on its operation. We'll talk about that in a minute. Actually, let's get right down to that. That's, that's a good segue. So I have two different telescopes here. You can see that they're made of the same material. They're both brass. That has no bearing on the conversation. But I thought it was appropriate. They look similar. Now... I'm not, this is not a joke, this is not a, I'm not messing with you, I'm not teasing you. Can you tell me what's different about these two telescopes? Someone tell me, what is different about these two telescopes? I want to hear it, I want to see what you say. There's kind of an obvious difference. 
Don't don't overthink it. Size, okay. Focal length, good. Focal length, very good. Very good. One has a longer focal length, very good. All right, not a trick question. Which one has a longer focal length? Not a trick question. Which one has a longer focal length? Okay, someone mentioned diameter. That's also true. This one has a larger diameter. Which one has a longer focal length? Longer length and aperture. This one, yeah. So this telescope has a longer focal length. That should not surprise you because it is physically longer. Okay, which one has a more, let's say, wider? Which one has a wider field of view? Hmm. Which one has a wider field of view? Don't say left or right because I don't know what you're talking about because I'm not sure if you're referring to... I guess you could. it's probably on your screen, so okay, I know what you mean there. But the small one. Ah, very good. So the small one achieves a wider, less magnified field of view because it has a shorter focal length. Focal length and magnification, so to speak, or field of view, which is more accurate, determines what you will see when you look through it or the images you will take. The shorter the focal length, the wider the field of view, the longer the focal length, the narrower the field of view. Now I have some graphics to help you understand this. Okay, this is fun. This graphic was created for photography, and I already mentioned that it's worthwhile to talk about photography in this context. It helps you understand it, because there's all sorts of helpful uh, information out there about photography, about focal lengths, lenses, things like that. And I kept the terminology on here. Notice on the bottom of the screen we have ultra wide angle, wide angle, standard, telephoto, and super telephoto. I, find, I kept these on because they amuse me, because these concepts of, like, for example, super telephoto are very much limited to photography. When we get into astronomy, these numbers become a little bit comical. So, in a nutshell, we have here a 600 millimeter lens, and it seems to have a fairly, let's say, narrow field of view. But then over here, we have a 15 millimeter lens. And we can see that it has a very wide field of view. Now, on a very basic level, without getting in, into the weeds too much, one of the ways a lens is designed to achieve a given focal length is by controlling its curvature. It's, it's uh, not a flat piece of glass, of course. If it was, it would be a window, wouldn't it? So a more curved piece of glass will focus light from a wider degree of angles. That was terrible, wider degree of angles. Uh, a wider range of angles. The photons coming from over there, and photons coming from over there, and photons coming from over there. Whereas a less curved optic will, will, will collect photons from a more narrow area in the sky or on the ground, depending on what you're pointing at. There's a lot to be said about this, but are there any questions so far? I have a lot to say, but let's see if you have any questions so far about this. Let's see. I, I'd like. I think there's at least one question worth answering before I get down to the details here. How many of you own a, a telephoto lens? Telephoto. Anyone? And how many of you have a bunch of lenses? Anybody? While you while I wait for your responses, I'm gonna look at my stuff a little bit. Yes. Good. So what can you let? Oh, well, it's very long. So someone has a 400 to 800. That's an unusually long telephoto lens, 800. Someone else says yes, yes, a bunch. Also 70 to 300. That's more common. So 70 is considered pretty long, and uh, 300 is quite long when it comes to photography. The size of your sensor also matters very much. Oh, we've got some more people raising hands. That's good. Do any of you have lenses that are so big that you need to use a tripod to hold the lens and not the camera? That's uh, always fun. At that point, it's hard to say that that lens is not a telescope. You'll find some very big lenses out there. Now, the size thing is a very important. I just demonstrated with these two telescopes. The longer the focal length, the longer the, the lens needs to physically be. And that can become cumbersome. That can become a problem. So, for example, I showed you a 300, or excuse me, a 250 millimeter lens. And this is a 55 millimeter lens. As you can see, this is much shorter than this one. 250 is considered telephoto, but when it comes to telescopes, that ain't nothing. And that's where I was kind of joking about the terminology here. Super telephoto amuses me because it, it's like so incredibly long, and yet it's very typical to buy telescopes that are multiple thousands of millimeters in focal length. Yeah, yeah, telephoto lens is very long, that's right. 
So that's all good stuff. These, I'm looking at the questions. Someone's asking about prime focus. That's an excellent question. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Understand again that in the context of photography, we're not talking about looking through the lens. We're talking about projecting an image onto a piece of film or a camera sensor. Yeah. So we're creating a flat image, or hopefully a flat image. But this is where we start to get into aberrations. Aberrations are when light doesn't do what you tell it to. So the light, light is being collected by the curved glass, and it's being told, so to speak, to focus on a certain part of a, let's say, a piece of film. And when you try to force light to do this, it's going to have to move through a piece of glass or bounce off of a curved piece of glass. We'll talk about that. Either way, either bouncing off something curved or being processed by something curved. And the light will misbehave like this. So this is an example of what we refer to as spherical aberration. You want all the light rays. Let's go, let's, these red lines are photons, so to speak. You want them all to end up in the same place. But here's what actually happens. And this is highly exaggerated, but... As you can see, because of the curvature of the glass, different photons end up being focused in different locations. This results in an aberration known as spherical aberration. And correcting for this usually involves using multiple pieces of glass. You'd have multiple lenses after this one intended to bring the, the, the light rays into agreement with each other so that you could draw a two-dimensional image. Now, the... Uh, this geometric problem is especially important in camera lenses versus eyepieces because if you're just looking through an optic, the human eye is curved. Our perception of sharpness or detail is, is kind of centralized. So we don't necessarily need to paint a picture, so to speak, that's perfectly uniform across its entire plane. So when a human being looks through a telescope eyepiece, these aberrations may be somewhat annoying, but they're not a deal breaker. But they can be a deal breaker for cameras because, again, you're trying to take a sharp image on a flat plane. And so one primary difference between camera lenses and telescopes is that a camera lens will often have multiple secondary optics internally, which are designed to correct and create a more flat field. The reason I'm telling you this and going into the weeds on this a bit is because there are different ways to solve these problems. That tends to be the way cameras solve it. But yeah, so spherical aberration is an undesirable artifact where you have images that are out of focus on the edges, so to speak, but sharp in the middle because of the curvature of the glass affecting light rays. Qu questions about that? Field flatteners are something that you can buy as an accessory for telescopes, and they do exactly what the camera lens is doing internally. Because, again, field flattening is very popular with photographers who are also astronomers, someone who wants to take pictures with their telescope. Yeah, good. Now, since you bring this up, let me jump ahead a little bit. This is a, even though this show I'm going to talk about basic, uh, let's say, common telescope types, there are some exotic types out there. This is what's known as a Rho Ackerman astrograph, and this is a new invention, recent. We're going to get one of these for the observatory someday. This is a, a cancer grain system. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. And there's a mirror here that's focusing light through a series of lenses which correct this heavily curved light, this highly aberrant light so that it can create a, a nice flat image, a nice sharp image uniformly where the camera sensor is. So, so someone mentioned field flatteners. This type of telescope actually has one built into it right there. Yeah, so just, just something to think about. There are ways to handle these aberrations uh, without adding accessories that can be built into the telescope itself. Anyway, let's talk about pros and cons. We're talking right now about refractors, which use lenses again. People think incorrectly that all telescopes have lenses. The thing is, lenses have some problems. Lenses create issues. Here's an example of one, spherical aberration. Let me show you another type of problem that lenses create. I'm going to show you a picture of, the, uh, of, the, of an image of one of our telescopes. Just give me one second. Where did I put it? I, I hope I didn't lose it. That would be very frustrating. Oh, yes, here it is. So this is an image that we took here of the planet Jupiter, and I've made no corrections to it. I have not improved or adjusted this in any way. Check it out. All right, what's wrong with it? Pick it apart. I don't care. I won't be offended. Tell me what's wrong with this image. Anybody? Anyone want to complain about the quality of this image? Feel free to identify issues with it. It includes a very obvious aberration that we haven't talked about yet. Let's see. 
Chromatic aberration. Very good, Jim White. Yes, blue haze, blue halo. You're all correct. Blue haze. Good. No, no. Someone says atmosphere. No, no. I wish it were the atmosphere's fault. This is the telescope's fault. I took this uh, image through our big six-inch refractor here at the observatory. Let me uh, really quickly show you in case you haven't seen that. Here's another image. This is another, this is another picture of the telescope as it was before we converted it to a Newtonian. And as you can see, in addition to the giant mirror of the Cassegrain, we also have this lens telescope. This is a six-inch refractor. Sometimes we call it our great refractor. I find it rather impressive. It's a, it's a big six-inch refractor. Oh, by the way, that's an important topic. What do we mean when we say six inches? What are we referring to when we say that's a six inch telescope? Anybody want to help me with that? What is that six inches referring to? Anybody? It's clearly not the length of it. This goes all the way down to the end of the telescope. That's 10 feet long. The refractor is about eight feet long. The aperture, the diameter, right. So the lens has a six inch diameter, or yeah, a, a strangely worded sentence. The lens is of six inches in diameter. That does not tell us the focal length. That tells us the, the diameter of, and someone mentioned the aperture, the diameter of the clear aperture or the actual diameter of the glass itself. You could have two different six inch telescopes with very different focal lengths. That's an important lesson. We'll, we'll probably have to repeat that a few times during this presentation. The diameter does not determine the focal length. The curvature of the optic determines focal length. So a less curved optic will have a longer focal length and a more heavily curved optic will have a shorter focal length. Yeah. Now, anyway, that's the that's the telescope that I used to take that picture of Jupiter that I showed you. Yeah, very good. That's right. It's an F15. Now, uh, this might be a good time to talk about that. I actually do want to go over focal ratios tonight. I'll do that after we talk about this Jupiter picture. Those of you who know telescopes, or maybe have been here before, or know me, or have talked about that telescope, know that that six-inch telescope is known as an acromat. That, that refers to how many lenses it contains and how good it is at controlling this problem that someone has already pointed out, which is known as chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is an undesirable color fringing. Someone mentioned the blue hazy ring. Some of you might also notice that Jupiter appears rather yellow. That's also wrong. So those are two false colors. We have a glowing blue halo around Jupiter, and then the planet itself looks rather yellow. I did not create that color with processing. Again, this is a this is image is unprocessed. I did nothing to improve the quality of this image. I should add that it's very easy to fix. These these issues are of course known to science and have been for many many centuries actually. And so with software, it's quite easy to fix these problems. But these problems do crop up when you use lenses. Here's why it happens. Chromatic aberration occurs because a piece of glass, let's say it's glass, it doesn't have to be glass, but let's say it's glass. A piece of glass will slow down different wavelengths of light to a different amount. And so what was relatively collimated light suddenly disagrees with itself when you have different rays landing at different places in geometric space. So, for example, if you were to focus the image on the green, which is typical, by the way, because human vision is, uh, is most sensitive to the green portion of the spectrum, now you have blue out of focus and you have red out of focus. If you, point toward, if you focus on the red, then you have the blue and the green out of focus. And by the way, of course, all the colors in between, the, mix, the mixing of colors. Chromatic aberration is a real problem. It is not easy to fix because it is the nature of any medium that processes light to create it. So because the light is passing through a material, you're going to have this effect. Can't you also get a chroma corrector? Well, I think you're thinking of a coma corrector. Coma correctors fix this problem. We'll talk about this problem in a minute. This is a very extreme coma. And some of you were probably shocked when you saw this image. Like, this is horrible. We'll get to that in a second. So yes, you can get filters to fix chromatic aberration. However, um, what they essentially do is waste the light. So for example, that image of Jupiter, I could get a filter that would eliminate that blue or violet fringe, but in doing so, you've, you've literally reduced the amount of light you have. So although filtering does work and it provides a more accurate image, it also reduces light because you're literally throwing some of it out. Yeah. yeah, so chromatic aberration is an issue that has plagued astronomers and photographers essentially forever because the very first optical systems only used lenses. This is one of the issues with lenses. Are there any questions about that? I'll tell you right now, there are also pros to these cons. Uh, you'll, as, as with everything, including, of course, anything in engineering, 
you tend to give and take. There's you're going to achieve one thing and you end up paying another thing because of it. In the case of refractors, they tend to have very high efficiency, meaning that most of the light that enters the lens will make it out. So you might have well over 90% efficiency. This high efficiency produces good contrast, an image that is as bright as it can be, and has good uh, variation between lows and highs. So refractors tend to have high efficiency, meaning they, they use most of the light they get. You actually get to see it. And they tend to produce a very pleasing, very high contrast image. But like I said, there's always give and take. Chromatic aberration is one of those gives. You, you give up color accuracy for refraction. Yeah, so now we see some people talking. Later designs use two lenses. Yeah, so this, is a, this image is a singlet, so a single lens. By the way, I have a singlet here, and this is kind of an unusual thing. This is from part of a, a telescope, a toy telescope, that was supposed to reproduce uh, Galileo's famous refractor. And I can tell you something. The images through this thing are horrendous. It looks like, well, it looks like a rainbow uh, mess. And uh, it's because there's no correction for this whatsoever. By the way, I should add, if you do purchase ca camera lenses, they will often brag about low chromatic aberration. And as someone points out, one of the ways to achieve this is by using multiple lens elements, which they do, but there's something else, multi-coating. Many of you have probably looked at an optic and noticed all the pretty colors. If you shift it in the position of the reflection of light, you'll see purples and greens and yellows. That's the multi-coating, which is actually fused to the glass via various means and pre-absorbs some of the more aberrant wavelengths. It also allows a lens optician, an engineer, an artist, to tune the color profile of a lens. And this is why... When it comes to camera lenses, there will be some lenses that are known for their great color or bad color because not all lenses are created equal. And one of the differences is the coatings that are used. The multi coatings can involve some, include some very rare, um, expensive materials, rare earth elements like lanthanum, for example, or thorium, which is radioactive. They used to use thorium in lenses. And if you collect vintage lenses, I do, I, I collect a lot of vintage optics. Um, some of them are radioactive because they use thorium as a material in the glass to give it better optical properties. Yeah. So, so one of the ways you can address chromatic aberration is by either impregnating the glass with certain materials or coating them with certain materials. And multi-coating is an extremely common practice. Essentially, all optics have some sort of coatings. And when you go shopping for them, there will always be some mention of how wonderful they are. Oh, perfect, fully multi-coated optics. But, of course, they don't tell you anything about the coating, so you don't know what that means. It, it might not mean anything. It could be nonsense marketing speak. But Okay, now, we immediately start to run into a cost problem. As you solve problems, you end up adding things. I mentioned the rare earth element lanthanum. It's a very, 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 very expensive material that increases the cost of production of the lens. As a result, creating a lens that does not produce significant chromatic aberration ends up becoming an expensive affair. And this is true now in the modern age, but it was also true back in the old days. Not only that, it adds weight. Someone mentions here, you can add multiple lenses. So you can have a doublet, which we have here at the observatory. So you have another lens after this one, which is fo focusing another, let's say, color palette. You can have a triplet, where you have a third lens, which is doing that even more. And by the way, triplets tend to have the most accurate color. We refer to those as apochromats. They tend to be also, what a surprise, very, very expensive. And they tend to be very heavy because you're adding more pieces of glass, and glass is heavy. So in summary, you can build a, a lens for a camera or a telescope that will perform very well, but it's going to cost you money and weight. It's going to be heavy and expensive or some combination of those two factors. There are, of course, alternatives. Before we get to them, are there any questions so far about the lenses? Or the, again, the refracting telescopes. I'm going to give you a minute. I bet there's some. There's got to be some questions. Can you put sensors in RGB focal points and combine full picture? So yeah, there are clever ways to actually stack the various uh, color receptors in a in a sensor to do exactly what you described. However, that's very expensive. Uh, when we create um, uh, lenses are small lenses. When we create sensors, they're grown in a, in a in a vat, very much like the same, exactly the same way we grow semiconductors for computer processors, and that has to be done in a single process. You put on layer after layer after layer, and there's certain uh, uh, manufacturing limitations on how how that how deep or thick that can be. It also obviously affects efficiency. For example, if the sensor was very deep, then the the the, the pixels on the bottom would get less light. These are all the, these are the kinds of considerations that one must make when designing a sensor. 
So to answer your question, yes, that can be done, but it tends not to be because it, it makes the lens, the, the sensor processing uh, much more difficult. Back in the old days, you used to curve a piece of film, and it, this was actually done to compensate for geometric issues, but theoretically it could also create some color improvement around the edges. So, so there, are, there are clever things one can do at the, focus, the focal plane, but the better solutions involve doing something with the optics themselves. Either the primary optic, the thing in the front, or perhaps secondary optic, optics within the tube, or last resort, putting some kind of filter at the end of the tube which absorbs the aberrant light so that you have a, a better image. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at these. Yeah, now, oh, hey, Ed makes a very good point. Uh, so in the, especially in the, let's say, last quarter of the 20th century, you, know, you could buy consumer camcorders, video recorders, where it had three different sensors, one for each color. They were all monochrome sensors, so all the colors, they had no color sens uh, sensitivity. But they, they were receiving different parts of the visual spectrum because, as someone points out, there was a, a dichro dichroic prism, which actually broke out, for example, the red and the green and the blue into separate beams, which was a very clever method because you could, it allowed you to, by moving the sensors in or out, focus on those colors individually. This process, though, for it to work properly, requires everything to be perfectly lined up, so you don't want to drop it or whack it because they can run on the, they can fall out of alignment. And also, not surprisingly, having three sensors with a high-tech prism inside makes this, the camera more expensive. That's an example of one of the, the, that's a sacrifice that we've made in modern cameras, having a single sensor because of cost. We, we're so impressed with the modern camera sensor performance that we uh, were able to overlook the fact that it's not exactly perfect. Yeah. That's a good question. Is the coating absorbed? Yeah, so when you use a coating, a multi-coating, it will actually absorb or sometimes reflect certain wavelengths. You, so essentially, you are wasting that light. That is one argument against doing this. And by the way, this is, I'm glad we're having this long discussion about this because it's, it's demonstrating why lenses are problematic. We go to great lengths to solve the problems with lenses. And these are some of the reasons why lenses are far, far out of vogue when it comes to astronomy. We don't tend to do major astronomy with lenses anymore, although there are some specific examples. But we use something else. Now, this is a good segue. So, famous fellow, this guy, let me get my head out of the way, good old Isaac Newton, invented that very important gizmo you see on the screen. Now, I might just happen to have one. Let me see. Oh, yeah, look at that. Now, of course, this is not Newton's telescope. This is a reproduction of Newton's telescope. Some of you might know that we, not surprisingly, refer to these as Newtonian reflectors. And there are no lenses in a reflecting telescope, or at least one like this. The Newtonian reflector uses not a lens, of course, but a mirror. I'm going to take off this lens cap, and you might see the mirror. Oh, yeah, there you can see it. Yep, there's a light being reflected. Yep. I'm trying to get that lined up so you can see it better. Yeah, there you go. So the mirror, the primary mirror of a Newtonian system, lives in the back of the telescope. A mirror does not process light the way a lens does. Light, light does not go through a mirror, it bounces off of it. And so a Newtonian system focuses light in front of the telescope. So this is the front where I'm pointing. So it looks this way. So space is that way. And right now you have a problem because if the telescope is focusing light in front of it, that means for me to look through it, I have to put my big head over here, which, of course, would block the aperture. So Newton added a secondary mirror, which is right there. You can see it held by three veins. And the secondary mirror has a very simple job. It is a flat mirror, not curved. It is a flat mirror that bounces light out, so to the eyepiece in this case. Or if you took the eyepiece out, some a piece of, let's say, film, for example. So the focal plane, notice I don't say focal point, by the way. The focal plane exits the chamber because of the secondary mirror. So a basic Newtonian reflector has two mirrors. It has a curved primary, that is a parabolic curvature, and then a flat secondary, which is angled so that the light from that curved mirror gets out of the tube, and that way you can look through it. Yeah. Now, why did Newton invent this? Well, Isaac Newton is famous for a lot of things because he was an absolute genius. And one of the very clever things he did that a lot of people don't know, he discovered or proved that, that white light is actually colored light. So Newton discovered that 
the, let's say the colors of the rainbow, so to speak, were contained within white light. And he proved this with prisms. He was able to take that rainbow, put it through another prism, and got back to white light. Now, this was a big deal because Newton had discovered a, a fundamental principle of light. And he somewhat arrogantly pro proclaimed that since he had made this discovery, he would invent a telescope that, that did not create chromatic aberration. Specifically, he claimed that he would invent a lens that did not create chromatic aberration. He failed in this endeavor, and it led him to invent the reflecting telescope. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This is a geometric drawing. We're not going to have math class or geometry class tonight, but I just wanted to show you that this is a parabola, a parabolic curve. And if you were to make a reflective surface, this shape, it would focus light, like a lens does, except, again, like I said earlier, it focuses in front as opposed to behind. Now, there are limitations to what you can get away with the parabola. The light will be focused inward if it, the parabola is too tall, so to speak. And obviously, we don't, we're not trying to focus an image on the inside of the telescope tube. Also, that image would be highly uh, unusual with light rays coming from so many different directions and angles. However, there are devices that make use of uh, shapes like this. For example, this is, this is a parabolic solar cooker. As you can see, they've placed a pot full of something delicious, I hope, at the focal plane or point of this parabolic dish. Now, you don't quite care about the quality of reflected sunlight when you're just trying to cook something. We're just trying to make it hot. So we're not trying to produce a high quality image with this. But as you can see, a reflector can cook food, or perhaps if it's done right, it can also form a sharp, clear image. Questions about that? Now, as I said earlier, when you, you tell light what to do, when you attempt to make light curve in ways that it doesn't want to, it will create aberrations. So parabolic systems are not free of aberration. Reflecting telescopes are not free of aberration. However, they are free of the type of aberration that Newton was trying to solve. Again, the chromatic aberration. Because the light is not passing through glass, because it's not being processed, so to speak, by a lens, he has eliminated the color problem. The light rays will not exhibit chromatic aberration. So indeed, Newton solved the problem he had set out to solve. What he didn't realize, though, was that he was also solving a lot of other problems that weren't really identified yet. Because his invention of a reflecting telescope made it possible for telescopes to become very large. You see, lenses have a size limitation. Let me go back to my uh, myself here for a second. Here's a much larger lens. By the way, this is a 500 millimeter camera lens from the 1940s. This was from a surveillance aircraft in World War II. And this is a pretty big lens, as you can see. Well, you know what? You can't see through it because I have the lens cap on. That's smart, by the way. Keep the dust out of your optic. There you go. Let's see if you can get my eyeball there. Gigantic eyeball. Oh, yeah, look at that work. <laughs> so. Lenses have some limitations. I mentioned already that they could become expensive and heavy. Well, this becomes more true the larger they get. If you want to build a giant telescope using lens technology, you have a serious problem on your hands because the weight of a lens is supported from the edges. What do you think would happen if you were to build a lens that was gigantic? Let's say you tried to build a lens that was 20 feet wide. What do you think would happen to the lens? What do you think? I'll, think, I'll let the engineers talk. Some of you are talking too much. Let's, let's settle down. Get some more involvement from other folks. What do you think would happen to a lens if you made it to be tremendously huge? Again, remembering that it's supported from the edges. What do you think? Ah, oh, very good. Someone says it would sag. This is a serious problem. If a lens sags, of course, its focal length is going to change. It's the figure is going to change, and it's going to produce a, a, a flawed image. So how do you solve this? Well, you use an incredibly thick lens so that it's hard enough not to sag under its own weight. Well, before you know it, you're dealing with an optical system that's thousands of pounds. And it's going to be at the end of a very long tube. So now you have some serious mechanical issues to deal with. Any questions about that? Glass cannot support its own weight. Yeah. Oh, by the way, where do you find these amazing vintage lenses? So yeah, uh, one of my friends, uh, James, he's in the chat, I think. He found this at ReStore in Seattle. Um, which they sell like uh, uh, recycled building stuff, you know, like 
old toilets and sinks and things. And they had this in a box. It was listed as as weird old telescope. Yeah. And uh, sure, sure, that's what it is. A weird old telescope. And then I had to I had to kind of invent some things to make it work. So I made this. You got this helical focuser. I got this on eBay, and that allows you to very conveniently focus it for a modern sensor. And I put an M42 mount on it, which is a common vintage lens format, which can be used to, to it can work with most uh, modern cameras with an adapter. Um, and then if I need to, I can rotate the entire assembly and even take it off. So this is like an adapter. See that? This is how it, would, this is how it originally looked. Yeah. Anyway. By the way, that's a good way to save money because lenses aren't cheap. And if you buy old junk and fix it up, well, you're being thrifty, aren't you? Yeah. We need to be thrifty here at Goldendale Observatory. We're not exactly flush with cash all the time. So, as I was saying, there's a limit to how big a lens can get because it has to support its own weight. And Newton inadvertently solved that problem with his invention because suddenly you had an optical system that was supported from underneath. You support a, a mirror from below. And so there's suddenly no limit to how big it can get. Someone mentioned a lens not being able to support its own weight. Yeah, the world's largest lens is at the Yerkes Observatory in Chicago, and that lens is actually cracked. It's actually cracked under its own weight. Imagine that. So it broke all by itself without anything bad happening to it. And that's over 40 inches. I think it's like 42 inches. So the largest functioning refractor is the Lick Observatory's refractor, which is a 36-inch. And that thing is enormous. It's a 50-foot-long tube. And by the way, that's a segue into something we're going to talk about in a second. So a very long... 52 foot long telescope with a 36 inch lens. Now 36 inches is not exactly gigantic because there are telescopes, as you probably know, that are enormously larger, that have apertures measured in multiple meters. So 36 inches ain't much when it comes to the size. This is another advantage of reflecting telescopes. They can become very, very big. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the fact that, ref that reflectors don't create chromatic aberration. They can also become very big. Are there any questions about that? I can't believe you found that restore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm looking at the uh, comments here. Oh, well, that's interesting. Someone points out single lens is fine for monochromatic light. That's true. If you were doing science that only required specific spectra, then you could use a surprisingly inexpensive optic. That's right. So let's see. Okay, these are all pretty good. So, so we just talked about refractors and Newtonian reflectors. They have pros and cons. But both of those technologies share a common problem. The physical length has a limiting factor on the focal length you can, so to speak, fit into the tube. So some trickery is required if you want to have an extraordinarily long focal length. And before I get to that, let me go to my video of our big telescope. Oops, hold that thought. Sorry about that. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna take my head away. This is our big telescope tracking the moon. I'm gonna pause this. So here's our big what is now a Newtonian, although it used to be a cancergram. We'll talk about that. And here is our old refractor. Now as you can see, the refractor is shorter than the Newtonian, uh, physically shorter. Not surprisingly, the two have different focal lengths, although they're not that different. Let me do something tricky here. Watch this. I'm going to flip the telescope. Now we have something inaccurate. I just want to get my head back in there. Um, the Okay, what is going on? Thank you, computer. Hold that thought, guys. Thank you. All right, now I see what's happening. Hold on a second, my friends. There. As I was saying before the computer decided to ruin the show, I have unrealistically flipped the image of the South Dome, and you can see that because the S is backwards, just so I can have some room to talk. Now... Physical lengths, different different focal lengths. So, for example, our, our telescope in its Newtonian form has a 3,000 millimeter focal length. And the telescope tube, if you want to call it that, by the way, the term is the OTA, the optical tube assembly, is 10 feet long. The refractor, the 6-inch refractor, has a 2,300 millimeter focal length. I mean, I'm rounding a little bit. It's an F15 refractor. And it's about 8 feet long. Now, if you do the math and do convert the metric to inches and whatnot, you'll find that, not surprisingly, the focal lengths are not that different from the mechanical length of the, or the physical length of the bodies. This is problematic because if you want to have a really long focal length, you need to build a really long telescope. Maybe you don't have room. 
Maybe you don't have the money. Maybe you can't afford to build an enclosure, a dome large enough to house a giant instrument like that. So there are some tricks. There are some uh, clever things one can do in, in order to solve this physical size problem of telescope. Now, before I get into that, someone mentioned F ratio, and I already mentioned it again, and I think it's worth saying. This is something that applies directly to cameras, and so it's something you're probably familiar with, F ratio. So, this telescope, our 6-inch refractor, has a focal ratio, an F ratio of F15, which is fairly slow in terms of uh, telescope optics. Uh, by the way, lower numbers are called fast because they develop film faster because they're collecting more light. Larger numbers are slower. Development is slower because, because they're collecting less light. So let's do some math. Let's bring up the calculator of science here. All right, it's calculator time. So this is very simple. If I have a 6-inch telescope and I have a f15 focal ratio, we multiply 6 by 15, that gives us the focal length. Now, right now, we're in inches. You see, the focal ratio is simply the, the relationship between the focal length and the aperture. These things can vary. For example, let me go back to myself really quick here. I have a 50 millimeter lens here, and I have another 50 millimeter lens. Actually, this is 55, but close enough. Notice that the lens in this one is much smaller than this one. So this is an f1.4, and this is an f4. So this one is much slower. This one is much faster. This one, however, is sharper because it's easier to make a small lens to high quality than a big one. Imagine that. So two optics with the same focal length, but very different optical apertures, different size lenses. Yes, it applies to cameras. It also applies to telescopes. So as I was saying, back to our calculator, a 90-inch focal length, let's multiply that by 25.4, which converts to symmetric, and we have a focal length of 2,286 millimeters. That's how you calculate focal length. It's also how you could, perhaps, if you wish, calculate the diameter of an optic without actually physically measuring it with a tape measure. It's handy for some people. Maybe you're interested in learning the, the particulars of your camera lenses. Now, I said that if you want to get away from this problem, well, you can't, can't you use a Barlow lens? Yeah, so you can artificially increase focal length with optics. But every time you introduce optics into a system, you add the opportunity for more aberrations. For example, in the case of a Newtonian system, there are no lenses. If you add a Barlow, that adds a lens, and now you have the opportunity for increased chromatic aberration, a problem you did not have before and other aberrations as well, depending on how high quality the Barlow is. And for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, a Barlow is a type of optic that uh, artificially, if you will, magnifies a telescope. It artificially lengthens the focal length before the eyepiece or the imaging plane so that you can essentially simulate the effect of a longer instrument than it really is. So as I was saying, there is some trickery afoot if you wish to solve this problem. And that trickery comes in the form of a type of telescope you've probably heard of before, the cancer grain. So cancer grains were not invented very long after Newton's invention. So Newton released the, uh, refle the reflector that he became so famous for in 1668. And cancer grain, a Frenchman, Laurent cancer grain, released his invention in 1672. So what is that? Four years. So a difference of four years. Something very clever is going on with the cancer grain system. We have the primary mirror, of course. Its focal length is set by its curvature. But then we modify the cone of light, leaving the primary with another curved mirror. Notice it says hyperbolic. We'll get to that in a second. The primary mirror is concave. The secondary mirror is convex. By altering the curvature of the convex secondary lens, you can artificially customize what we call the effective focal length of the instrument without actually changing the primary focal length. And this is done so that you can cram a long focal length into a short package. What a clever thing. Now I'm going to show you an extreme example of that. I have a cool prop to show you. This is one of our telescopes that we use here at the observatory. This is a 7-inch Maxitov Cassegrain. We'll talk about what the Maxitov means in a second if you're interested. Now, I want you to notice the physical length of this telescope. It's not even two feet long. I'm going to repeat. This telescope is not even two feet long. 
And yet, it has a focal length that is 8 feet 75 inches. Its focal length is longer than that of that 9 foot long refractor that we have in the observatory. And that's because the cancer grain employs two mirrors which alter each other's, uh, or let's say the secondary alters the primary focal length to create a secondary effective focal length that is artificially longer. Now you might think, well that solves everything, that's perfect, what a perfect telescope. Well, they're popular, they are popular for that reason, but they have their own issues, which we'll talk about in a second. A little like the LIGO lasers. Um, no, because the LIGO lasers, they're just creating a longer run because the lasers are bouncing back and forth, but it's not modifying the convergence angle of the lasers, although there are some optics for that purpose. Whereas in this case, we actually are modifying the cone of light's convergence, how rapidly it converges into a plane or a point. So it's not quite the same as increasing the length of a laser track because the laser just has to go farther, so it's a straight line, so it can bounce off flat mirrors. In this case, we're talking about curved mirrors affecting other curved mirrors. Now I'm going to show you something. Something you normally don't get to see because it's dangerous and I don't recommend it. I've already taken this apart because I'm working on fixing something wrong with it. You're going to see the primary mirror of a cancer grain system. Something you normally don't get to see because you should not do what I'm doing because you will ruin something. So hold that thought. I'm going to put the mirror over here. I'll show it to you in a second. First, I want to show you the secondary. So as you can see, there's a piece of glass which is curved. That is called a Maxitov corrector. We'll get to that. And as you can see, there's a piece of something in the middle, metal in this case. And on the back side of that is the curved mirror we talked about, the secondary mirror. It's kind of neat with the story behind it. Let me see if I can maneuver this properly. There you go. Hello. See the mirror there? So you can see the secondary mirror and the correcting plate in front of it. Hold the thought about the correcting plate. Let me show you the primary mirror. It is so extremely curved that you can probably tell that it's curved. Let's see if I can focus something here. There's a light. <laughs> this mirror is an F2, which is extremely fast for a 7-inch mirror. This is a 7-inch diameter mirror. You can see the curvature of it right there. See that? The reason it's so heavily curved is so the rays of light converge rapidly so that we can fit our optical pathway into a short package for the reason of portability. But there's no free lunch. Like I said earlier, when you make light do things it does not want to do, it punishes you with aberrations. Now, I, show, I briefly showed you this picture earlier. Since James is in the room, he helped me conduct this funny experiment a few years ago. Watch this. I, um, we took a, a Newtonian, excuse me, a cancer grain reflector apart. And we placed a camera at the prime focus. So the prime focus is the location where the light rays converge. We didn't put it back here because we had removed the secondary mirror. So the primary light cone was focusing right here, and that's where we put the camera. And this is the picture we got. Would you call that a high-quality image of stars, my friends? Is this a nice, sharp image of stars, or do you perhaps see a few problems? Any, any issues with this, this image of stars, or does this look nice to you? What do you think? Yes, those bizarre guitar pick-shaped donuts are stars. The black center hole of these donuts is the obstruction created by the camera, the shadow of the camera, if you will. And the reason they have a comet-like shape is because of the extreme curvature of the primary mirror. You cannot bend light this much without issues like this. But this is an extreme example of what's known as coma. Coma is called that because it refers to the appearance of comets. It turns stars into comets, as you can see. It is, of course, very undesirable. And the way one corrects for it is by using a hyperbolic secondary. You saw that word used in that frame earlier. Let me see if I have that handy again. Notice the word hyperbolic. The curvature of this, this secondary mirror... Oops, sorry. Actually, that's, I'm going to use that, that picture in a second because this was also a classical castle grain. So... The hyperbolic secondary's curvature is different from that of a parabola. A parabola is a more simple curve. It's, a, it's with a single foci. We have two with the hyperbola. Hyperbolas 
are not consistently curved. They can be they can curve this way and then go expand out that way. For example, I'm not going to over I'm not going to get into that too much tonight. But by customizing the curve of the hyperbola, you can correct for some of the extreme aberrations you just saw from the primary curved mirror, which the parabolic is so heavily curved. By the way, it's cheaper to produce parabolic mirrors than hyperbolic, for not surprisingly. And so that's one of the reasons we don't use two hyperbolic mirrors, although there are telescopes that do that. For example, a type of telescope known as a Ricci Cretion, which, by the way, the Hubble telescope is. That's what the Hubble telescope is. That system uses two hyperbolic mirrors, and that allows for even better correction of the aberrations that we're talking about. But there's something else you can do. You can make the mirror, you can make the color, the light, so to speak, curve less. Now, in this case, we have a radio telescope where the quality of the image is less important, so we can curve quite a lot. And as you can see, the secondary is very close to the primary. Radio telescope, by the way, same principle, even though it's not light the way we think of it, visible light. Radio waves are also focused in the same way. So very cleverly, you can employ these same concepts to non-optical wavelengths. But then here's our old telescope at the observatory. Before we converted it to a Newtonian, it was what was known as a classical Cassegrain. Now, in a classical system, you have a secondary mirror artificially increasing focal length, but the mirror, the primary, is not curved as much, which allows you to cut down on the aberrations. The problem is that, that forces you to make the telescope fairly long, and so that cuts down on the portability a bit. Our big telescope, when it was a classical Cassegrain, had a 9,000 millimeter effective focal length which was excessively long because it only allowed the telescope to work at very high magnification, which is not always desirable. So one of the ways to solve the aberrations is by not going crazy with the curvature of the optics. But you know how consumers are. Everyone wants everything. Everyone wants everything that they buy to be as small and compact and cheap and light and not produce as much heat, et cetera, et cetera. It needs to be impossible. And so we deal with these engineering paradoxes. In the case of a Cassegrain system, Consumers want a very long focal length crammed into a very short package. And so one of the ways we get away, from, away, away with this is by pre-correcting the light. So hold that thought, because I actually forgot to grab one really quick. I have a Schmidt passage right here. This is an extremely common type of telescope. This is a 5-inch Schmidt Cassegrain. Go ahead and take the lens cap off. This is like what we talked about. The corrector plate here, the piece of glass, is not just a window that holds the secondary mirror. It is slightly and very it is very subtly curved to pre-correct the rays of light before they strike the primary mirror so that they have less aberrations. Schmidt cancer grains are very popular and they sell gajillions of these things because they provide a nice relationship between cost and portability, size, performance, blah, blah, blah. I personally don't like them very much. I have a strong uh, bias against them because they have a large secondary mirror and that tends to reduce contrast and also efficiency. So this is one of the trade-offs. You know, like I said, there's always give and take. There's always uh, pros to cons. One of the prices you pay for this design is a relatively large secondary obstruction, which reduces contrast. So the image contrast of a schmidt cassegrain like this will be inferior to that of, for example, a refractor. So enter the Maxitov cassegrain. Maxitov correctors are more aggressive. It allows for a more extreme focal ratio. Notice that it's more heavily curved. So this glass plate holding the secondary is not nearly flat. It actually is a type of lens. This type of telescope is literally a combination of lens and mirror. Maxitov reflectors, Maxitov cassegrains, can have unusually small secondaries, which dramatically increases, increases their focal length, or excuse me, their, their contrast. Unfortunately, uh, they tend to be expensive because of the much thicker and much more difficult to manufacture curved meniscus lens that holds the secondary, but they are popular if you want high contrast and a Cassegrain in the same telescope. I happen to like this particular optical prescription. It's a 7-inch F15, and it results in a relatively small central obstruction and very good contrast. So pros and cons. We've gone over a lot of stuff. Are there any questions so far about any of that? 
So Ed here has named correctly the type of optical design, a catadioptric. And this is, a, again, a combination lens reflecting system. So we've learned a bit about how telescope optical systems curve light and how we get away with the curvature of light, how we, how we uh, correct for the aberrations created by our forcing light to do what it doesn't want to do. I have a few more things to talk about, but are there any questions so far? So Ed, Ed's talking a whole bunch tonight. So let's see, anyone else? Let's see, angular distort. It's art. <laughs> That's funny. I assume you're talking about the, the image with the, uh, with the stars in it. Yeah, it's art. That's funny. So uh, let's put that back up because that was a delightful picture there. There we go. So yeah, here's, our, here's our art donuts. Let me put this extremely fragile thing back so I don't accidentally knock it off the desk. Here's your last look at the 7-inch primary mirror of a Maxitov Castle Grain Telescope. Heavily curved. And by the way, this is not made of glass. This is quartz, which has a superior thermal expansion coefficient to glass and is also harder, which allows it to be thinner. And uh, the thinner is good because it cools down faster. Okay. Last chance to talk about telescopes. We're going to end the show by talking a little bit about mounts. We're a little bit over time, but I think this is a worthwhile show. So. On the output side, can you easily self-harm? You mean like burn yourself? I mean, if you point at the sun, I guess. <laughs> yes, so someone asked the question, will this first lens introduce color aberrations? Yes, it will. And that's another shortcoming, if you will, of, of catadioptric systems because you are losing one of the advantages of a reflecting system in that you are introducing some chromatic aberration. By the way, let's see if I can get this. Can you see pretty a pretty purple color? Let's see if we can get this. I'm trying to find a reflection. You know what? I'm not, I'm not succeeding. Yeah, okay. So you see how everything seems to have a purple cast to it? That's one of the multi-coatings that are used to control chromatic aberration. But again, like I said earlier, that's not a perfect solution because it does waste light a bit. Yeah. Good. By the way, if I haven't said it yet, be aware, the same concepts we're discussing in the, in the realm of consumer telescopes also apply to giant telescopes. Um, but with giant telescopes, you tend to have giant budgets, and so you can design systems that are for, far more specialized for the, the job, the work that they're intended to do. So they may, they may have extraordinarily high tolerances or very low tolerance, very tiny tolerances when it comes to aberrations because you can build them for a very specific purpose, not general, not general use. Yeah. What about using piezoelectric oscillations to move the CCD forward and backwards to get data to collect correct aberrations? Well... That actually, what you describe is actually done, but it's not done for the purpose you describe. Uh, we can actually cause sensors to quiver, so to speak, or have a, a secondary optic above them which quivers to compensate for Earth's atmosphere. Because one of the problems you have when you look at space objects is that the light is not behaving itself to begin with. Even before it gets into your wonderfully well-corrected optical system, it's already all over the place because of the Earth's atmosphere distorting it. And so solving that problem can involve, for example, something very much like what you just described, a moving or quivering sensor, or maybe some material above it which does the same thing. For that to work, it has to have a very advanced computer control system and some means of, con of collecting information about the, the atmosphere so it can make uh, the, the proper, the appropriate corrections. Good question. So, since you brought that up, some of you might be aware of an amazing technology called adaptive optics. Now, what I'm going to show you right now is not fake, but when you see it, you're going to swear this is like science fiction. I want to repeat, what you're about to see is real. What is going on in this picture? Are we declaring war on aliens? Are we firing lasers at some unfortunate star system? Some of you might know what this is. This is an adaptive optic system. We're firing sodium lasers, and that's why they're yellow, into the sky. They reflect off layers of upper atmosphere and create an artificial star. A camera watches this artificial star. Here's a better picture here. The camera, which is, by the way, attached somewhere on the tele... Actually, it's right, it's right here. The camera observes the artificial star, can determine what is happening to the upper atmosphere, and very cleverly, it can actually distort the primary mirror. Here's a guy... By the way, here's a good scale. There's a guy standing here. The primary mirror has these many, many servo mechanisms beneath it. 
zoom in here. These servos are actually stressing the primary mirror, causing it to bulge as needed to distort in such a way that it compensates for the effect of Earth's atmosphere. This is called adaptive optics. Not surprisingly, this process is highly expensive, and so it's not something you can normally afford for everyday consumer use. Of course, only major research observatories employ this technology in this way. There is a smaller system, though, that can do something similar, and I mentioned it earlier, having a secondary optic that quivers above the sensor, and that is something that's vaguely affordable, but it's not as effective as what we're showing here in this video. Very impressive. Yeah, so I think that's neat. Yes, adaptive optics, that's correct. Okay, last chance to talk about telescopes before I get to mounts, and then we end the show. Although I, I, we have some time for a few other things too. But thoughts, thoughts. I'm looking at my comments here. Let's see, what are the, what are the fans used for? Oh, so, so that's a great question. A telescope's very similar to what we were just talking about. Earth's atmosphere distorts light. Well, unfortunately, even the air inside of the telescope chamber, like the dome, or inside the telescope tube can also distort light. If you have an optical system like a lens or a mirror, which is significantly different temperature than the air around it, it will create a boundary layer of air which distorts light. And this can have a dramatic impact on the, on the, on the performance of a telescope. This is one of the reasons why if you're going to use a big camera lens or a telescope, you need to put it outdoors well ahead of time so that the optics can cool down or heat up to the ambient temperature. With a, with a system like this, because it's a sealed tube, it takes a long time for the mirror to cool down or heat up to ambient temperature, and so the, the fans are there to help speed that process up a bit. That's a very good question. By the way, that's one of the reasons I like open truss telescopes, where you don't have an enclosed tube, because it allows air to move through and you don't have this problem with tube weather, so to speak. Yeah, good question. Does the huge mirror get dusty? Yeah, so we, of course. and. Um, it depends on who you're talking to or what telescope we're talking about, but you tend to want to clean mirrors with some kind of high pressure gas like, like nitrogen, um, which is very dry. It's been dried inside the tube before you fire it. Or even just compressed air if it's a normal system, but the problem with compressed air is it can also have dust and moisture in it. It's much better than touching the mirror. You don't want to touch the mirror. That's why I was being so careful with the one I just took out of that telescope. Don't touch it, because yeah. you'll never get your fingerprints off. Um, you can clean a mirror in like a deep, soap solution and water, but it's not a process you want to have to do. I have done it. It's time consuming and nerve wracking because you're always like, I'm going to slip and scratch it. You don't want to scratch it. Yeah. Okay. Finally, zero coefficient of thermal expansion material like zero dirt. So yeah, um, the quartz is not as good as zero dirt, but it's also cheaper. Zero dirt is an extraordinarily expensive ceramic product and it is used in some of the world's most advanced telescopes, but it also costs an arm and a leg and another arm and another leg. So it's not something you just see laying around. You sometimes see little bits of it for sale on like Astromart and eBay and stuff, and even for the small parts, they're quite expensive. Yeah, it's highly sought after. It's not a new material, it's been around for a long time. There's, a, there's actually a few next generation telescope substrates, but what we found is it's sometimes desirable to find more creative ways to use existing substrates just, just for reasons of cost. You, you wanna save cost where you can. Okay, we've talked about telescopes a bit, talked about optics a bit. Let's talk about a basic problem. You take a picture of the sky and it has some issues. For example, here's a picture I took of the Andromeda Galaxy as just an experiment. Please don't judge this too harshly. I was just testing equipment. And if I zoom in a bit, I see a problem. Do you see a problem? Is there anything wrong with this picture? Notice how the stars are not points. They seem to be little streaks, aren't they? Oh, wow. Why does that happen, my friends? Hold that thought. Sure. Oh, look, it's even worse. And look, not only are the stars streaks, they're little curved streaks. What? What's going on? What happened to the universe? Yeah, okay, well, that's true. Long exposure, but why does that ruin my image? Of course, you have to do a long exposure for an object like Andromeda because it's a dim object. Earth is rotating. Very good. Because our planet rotates, everything you look at in the sky tends to move or appears to move. And so it ruins your long exposure photographs. One of the reasons that photography is employed by astronomers, of course, is because a, a photographic exposure over time can collect far more light than your eyeball can. But you have this problem. You're trying to collect light over time from an object that appears to move from your vantage point because you live on a spinning planet. So what does one do? 
gears on mount are not perfect either. That's right. And also it was windy. So the fact, the reason that the um, the stars are curved like that, like little candy canes, is because the wind was shaking the telescope. So that's a whole other problem. Uh, I turned off the tracking system. Hold that thought. And it was windy. And that's why this happened. By the way, that's one of the reasons we put telescopes in domes. It blocks the wind of it. Yeah. All right, long story short. If you want to take a picture of the universe and you want that picture to not be ruined like this, you need to make your telescope move. Oh, by the way, do you see that line there? Do you see that? Let's see. See that straight line? That is actually a satellite. See that? Which went across the field while I was imaging it. So the previous image was a little bit better, wasn't it? See that? The stars are a little bit sharper. Now they're a little bit longer. And that's because in this image, I had a telescope mount that was at least trying to track. It was using a piece of junk that I was experimenting with. That's why I was taking this picture to see how poorly it tracked. And boy, did it track poorly. But it was better than nothing, as you can see. Yeah, nothing, something. Yeah. So let's talk about this. If you want your telescope to follow an object, so to speak, you need to employ some clever mechanical solutions. All right. Some of you might know what this thing is. Let's see if I can get my face back in here somehow. Okay, that works. This apparatus in front of me is what's known as a, a German equatorial mount. And this is an old invention that goes back 200 years or more. Invented by a young German optician named Fraunhofer, hence the name German Equatorial. They're not necessarily made in Germany. This type of mount solves the problem of Earth's rotation in a simple way. You notice this axis here is crooked, points at a certain angle. Well, that happens to match, if you set it up properly at least, Earth's axis of rotation. That means that roughly this shaft would be pointing at the North Star. Again, I say roughly because the North Star is not perfectly exactly in the center of the North Celestial Pole, but it is close enough. Now, this will only be good at a certain latitude unless you have a means of adjusting it. So this one is adjustable. See that? So I can adjust the, the latitude, or really the altitude adjustment of the right ascension axis to match the apparent angle of Earth's axis from your observation location. So once, let's pretend we did it. So let's pretend that we have perfectly aligned this with the north. Then this gear turns, and as you can see, this assembly rotates. See that? And if it spins at the correct speed, known as the sidereal rate, which is a combination of Earth's rotation speed and also our revolution around the sun, then objects in the sky will appear to stop. This is an equatorial mount, and this is how we, one of the ways, rather, that we solve the problem of Earth's rotation. Yes, gem. Someone said this is, someone has, um, some, has abbreviated it. That's what we call these gems, German equatorial mounts. Questions about that? The problem with gems, they have to be perfectly aligned to the Earth's axis or they don't work properly. So there's a setup involved. And, it, and it's quite annoying. You'd be surprised at uh, how tiny of a misalignment will result in problems for tracking. Also, this is only half the mount. There's also another arm that would go across here like this, and it would have a counterweight on it, and that would hold the telescope via another declination axis. That's the, the axis of declination allows you to point the telescope up and down, so to speak. The right ascension axis rotates really primarily to stop the rotation of Earth. Buzz and audio, really? That's interesting. I'll have to check that. Maybe, my, maybe this metal box is causing interference. All right, this is very heavy. I'm putting this down. And I'm going to pick up another kind of mount, which until recent history was impossible. OK, this type of mount is known as an alt-azimuth mount. Alt is for altitude. Azimuth is left and right. I'm going to drive, now this one is electronic, as you can see. So left and right is azimuth. Up and down is altitude. See the, the mount here? That's where your telescope would be. Traditionally, this type of mount could not track the sky because it has no mechanical alignment to the Earth. However, because we live in the future and we're surrounded by high-tech microcomputers and they're super cheap now, 
a telescope mount like this can have a computer brain which enables it to actively control both axes of motion to compensate for Earth's motion. This is another way to do it, and this is a much more relative, a much more modern solution. For most of history, this type of mount could only allow you to point, thing, point at things, but it wouldn't allow you to track because it, requ it required the deliberate coordination of two axes of motion. But thanks to computer technology, it is now possible for an altazimuth mount to track the sky. Why don't we do this with everything? Well, they have their own pros and cons. Hope that thought I'll talk about it. But I should tell you, one of the advantages of this design, it does not need to be perfectly aligned with Earth's axis. In fact, all you have to do to make this work properly is make it level. So when you install it, make sure it's flat. Yes, very convenient. Let's go back to your zero position, buddy. Telescope mount parking all by itself because we live in the future. Wow, yeah. Okay, turning that off. Now, briefly. I said that that type of mount has its own problems. As we've said with engineering, there always seems to be a give and take. So let me show you. I haven't heard any buzzing. That's good to know. Okay. Watch this, guys. You might enjoy this. Okay, here's the sky over Goldendale. Let's go back to now. Now. Let's, let's lock onto an object. Let's go to Jupiter, for example. Just for, actually, you know what? Let's do Saturn. Okay. I'm going to simulate the effect of Saturn being trapped in a telescope using an equatorial mount. Oh, actually, no. I take it back. I'm going to use an altazimuth mount. And you're going to notice something very annoying. Notice how Saturn seems to be rocking back and forth, teeter-tottering. This is known as field rotation, and it's one of the problems associated with alt-azimuth mounts, because essentially the, the mount is looking at the sky like you would, straight up and down, left and right. But the sky seems to proceed along an arc, because you live on a round planet which is spinning. So one of the disadvantages of an alt-azimuth mount, although very, uh, very convenient for setting up, because it only has to be level, is that they create this phenomenon known as field rotation. This also can ruin a long exposure photograph. Now, Saturn is not a good example because you wouldn't use a long exposure photograph to take a picture of a planet. But if you go to, let's say, I don't know, my favorite space object, the Orion Nebula, which, by the way, is gigantic in this image, this is an object where you need to take a very long exposure to make it work. And as you can see, it'll rock like this. And that rocking is very bad because it will ruin the image. So if you want to take a long exposure, with an altazimuth mount, you need to employ another device, and this is funny, called a field derotator, and it actually rotates the camera to compensate for the field rotation induced by the mount. That may sound silly, it may sound like, well, why wouldn't you just use an equatorial then? Depends on the installation, depends on the budget, depends on the enclosure, depends on the topic of the study. I mean, there's so many factors that, that affect the decision about what kind of mount you buy for a given task. Now. If I switch the mount time to equatorial, I'm actually moving through time right now and you wouldn't know it because the mount essentially moves with the sky like that. So it tilts, so to speak, with the sky. So even though time is proceeding right now, you don't seem to see anything changing because the mount essentially moves with the way the sky moves, in the way the sky moves. Let me go back to altazimuth and we have this horrible gyration going on. Yes, don't throw up. Questions about that? So, if you want to take a picture like this, which is, let's say, very long, let's say you want to take a, a multi-hour exposure of the Andromeda Galaxy, you would definitely want to employ an equatorial mount if you didn't want to also have to buy a field derotator like we just talked about. Any questions about that? All right, we're, we went about half an hour. I expected this to be a long show, but we're half hour over my normal hour uh, target. Uh, I would like to start wrapping it up. I do have a few more pictures and videos to show, but um, let's see if we have any thoughts. Let's start finishing it up. Start to think complaint. Let's, let's make sure we uh, get all of our all questions answered. By the way, watch this. Um, some of you may have seen this video I did of the comment. And you can see here the comet seems to be moving. And of course it is. That's true. What you're seeing is the actual motion of the comet. 
but the stars don't seem to be moving. However, let me show you how it used to look before I processed it. Notice how the entire image seems to be rotating. Notice how the entire field seems to be twisting. That is field rotation induced by the apparent motion of the sky thanks to the perspective of an alt azimuth mount, which again only sees the universe as we would, up and down and left and right. So everything seems to spin. And you could argue that in this case it's kind of cool looking, I think. I, I kind of like it, and that's why I did it. Although it's very undesirable when it comes to doing long exposures. In this case, every exposure was only 30 seconds, so it didn't create a big problem for the stars, although it did create this, this accuracy issue. So when I derotated it, it, it better, it better uh, reveals the motion of the comet and not the stars. Yeah. How does the alt azimuth know what rates to rotate if they are, aren't referenced to the Earth's axis of rotation? Because the brain, the computer brain of the alt azimuth mount, knows what the sky looks like, so to speak. It has an internal star chart. It knows the coordinates of a given object at a given moment. It knows where it is because you either manually program it with your longitude, 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 your longitude and latitude, or it has GPS. It, you also tell it what time it is. And so since it knows where it is and it knows what time it is, it knows where a given object should appear in the sky. And then once you point at a given object, it will make these deliberate adjustments to both axes of motion to compensate for its motion. The, the, that's a much more involved process. And it's made possible thanks to microcomputer technology. Yeah. What software you used? Are you asking for processing the video? I use Adobe After Effects for most everything. Big fan of After Effects. I'm a big Adobe fan. I have been using it. I've been using Adobe products since I was a teenager, back in the 1990s. Um, Adobe uh, After Effects is like Motion Photoshop. So it's, it's if you know if you're comfortable with Photoshop, it's it's good for well, it's good for everything. Really. <laughs> yeah, the key is time and position, location are known. That's right. Very good. Okay, I'm gonna. Clean up my, my chat here a bit, looking at stuff. Let's see. It's art. Output side. Any objects to view at the next few weeks? I mentioned that someone asked about objects this week. If you get up very early morning before sunrise on Tuesday, you'll get to see Saturn and Mercury in a um, conjunction. Can you show the focus mechanism on that telescope? Hey, that's a wonderful question. I assume you're talking about the Maxitov Cassegrain. One of the ways you can focus a Cassegrain is by actually moving the primary mirror. So watch, I'm going to turn this knob, and you'll see, you see there's a gap forming right here? See where my finger is? I'm actually moving the mirror downward. See that? The mirror is actually receding away from the secondary mirror. And if I do it this way, it goes up. See that? Now this is actually one of the advantages of Cassegrain systems. Since you're moving the primary mirror, and since the light cone is being altered by that convex secondary, the, the focus depth on a cancer grain is huge. I mean, it equates out to like multiple feet of focus travel if you had a more traditional focuser. So, so that's very forgiving if you want to do clever optical tricks with a telescope, like hook up bino viewers or, or prism systems and you know, splitters and all kinds of crazy things. You can do all sorts of optical stuff with a cancer grain because you have an enormous range of focus travel due to the amplification, if you will, of the focusing effect by the secondary mirror. That's a very good question. By the way, this one has terrible focus uh, problems, and that's why I've taken it apart. Uh, it has a lot of what we call focus backlash, where it slops around a bit. I'm, I'm fixing it. It's a very expensive telescope, and it's worth fixing. Wonderful optics, terrible mechanics. Some of, some of you might know what brand this telescope is, and if you, if you did, it makes sense. It's made in Russia. Yes, it's a company called Intez Micro. And it's, it's quirky, let's say. It's, it has its idiosyncrasies, let's say. Yes. Mirror flop, that's right, mirror flop. A very serious mirror flop. Actually, the worst I've ever seen. Worst mirror flop I've ever seen in any telescope ever. So, good job. Yeah. Okay, so, um, wrapping it up. Questions? I'm looking at this chat. Does, uh, these are all good. Yeah, these are pretty good questions. Yeah. We covered, it looks like we covered everything good. Okay, so... In the interest of wrapping up, hey, I forgot to show you a picture. Remember we talked about chromatic aberration? You tend to really notice it with bright things. So look, here's the moon shot through our six-inch refractor. Very nice, sharp image. It looks beautifully sharp. But notice the blue glow and the yellow glow around the craters. Notice the, the edge. See? 
So yeah, chromatic aberration quite evident, especially with bright things. Yeah. Yeah, someone liked the show. I don't know that everyone will. Like I said, this is not a topic that everyone likes. Now, this is not. A, a, I've discovered that telescopes are not the most popular thing for us to talk about here at good old Goldendale Observatory. In fact, I even got a complaint letter about it once. A woman came here to look through the telescope. She came to learn about space stuff. We ended up talking about the history of the building and the telescope because we had our former director here, and it was it was a nice night, I thought. But no, she was mad about it. She's like, I didn't come all this way to learn about some old telescope. She was quite mean about it. So I learned that not everybody likes uh, topic, this topic, for example. All right, so uh, exotic things. We talked about optical wavelengths. Not all telescopes work in optical wavelengths. I showed you a picture of a radio telescope. Here's a picture of the mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope. Notice that it's gold. And by the way, it is gold. The, the mirror, of course, is not solid gold, but it's co gold coated. And that's because the James Webb is not an optical wavelength telescope. It's an infrared telescope. In infrared light, it's more efficiently reflected by gold. But the same optical concepts apply, even though you might be using different materials to reflect different wavelengths. Yeah. Here's a picture of a, a funny little gadget from the olden days. This is called a Schmidt camera. And this is a, a type of Cassegrain, well, yeah, okay, I'm just going to say that. And it has a, a clever solution to the geometry problems we talked about to, tonight. Instead of using elaborate glass correctors, in this case, we correct for geometry. And by the way, hopefully this will this will appeal to someone who was asking about creative means of solving aberrations. In this case, we solve the aberrations by literally installing the film negative so that it's curved. So there's a cur so the, plate, the plate that the film adheres to or attaches to is curved. As I understand it, these were extremely challenging to install because you had to do it in total darkness. So you had to take your film negative and apply it to this curved mount inside the tube without introducing any light that might ruin it and, of course, also without introducing any filthy fingerprints. So people would wear gloves and whatnot when they did it. So yeah, this is one of the older fashioned ways to solve the geometric aberrations we talked about tonight by literally installing the film in such a way that it is curved. It did work, and some fantastic pictures were taken with Schmidt cameras, but they also uh, were a real pain to load, as I understand it. Yeah. Curved film, that's right, very good. Here's something fun for you. So this is a picture of a 13-inch refractor with an F5 focal ratio, which is, by the way, quite fast for a refractor. And as you can see, there is no eyepiece here, but a huge metal slot for the um, film, or in this case, the, the plate, the, the, optical, the, the uh, photographic plate. And this thing could illuminate a piece of film or optical plate or a photographic plate 14 inches by 7 inches. So that's a huge, a huge imaging plane. So that is uh, an example of a telescope, an astrograph, just like that Schmidt camera, which is also an astrograph, an instrument not intended for human use but specifically to take pictures. In this case, very wide field pictures. Yeah. And uh, you'll notice there's an eyepiece down here. That is a guide scope. This is a smaller telescope. And this is what an operator, a human operator, would look through to help keep the telescope on target over hours of exposure. This is back in the day before a device known as an auto guider. This was all manual. So you had to make small adjustments to the speed of the motors, for example, manually using knobs and a human operator would watch, for example, a given guide star, and every time it drifted, they'd make small adjustments. And this is how they took high-quality pictures. So it should, I should point out that astrophotography, still today, but especially back then, is not an automatic process where you just push a button and you walk away and then you come back a few hours later and you have beautiful long exposure photographs. It is a very hands-on process, again, especially in the old days, before wondrous computerized technology made everything easier. Yeah. Dry ice cooled old film mounts. Yes, any I don't have any pictures like that, but yes, cooling film is also another way of reducing noise. Same with sensors, by the way. Uh, many modern sensors and cameras are, for telescopes are cooled because thermal noise, the atoms and molecules moving inside the sensor, can actually create electrical noise, which reduces the fidelity of the image. Yeah. So in addition to geometry and mechanical solutions, we also had to control the temperature of the imaging plane. That's right. That's, good. That's a good observation. 
Someone now, so Ed here says spend equal amounts on OTA and mount. I kind of disagree because I get so I get so annoyed with the mechanics of a bad mount that I'd rather put a. And I'm not joking. I'd rather put a relatively cheap, junky telescope on a really expensive, nice mount because you won't be plagued with the obnoxious issues associated with a crummy mount where it slops around or it tracks unevenly and or it's, it's, it won't stay on target or the wind blows it or it shakes. There's so many issues associated with mounts. And a lot of, by, by the way, a lot of, if you're, if you're here tonight learning about computer, uh, telescopes you might want to buy, people often ignore the mount and they go for the optical system, but they don't realize the, how darn important it is that your mount be strong and steady. Yeah. All right, did we learn anything tonight? This was probably our longest show or one of the longest shows, but I don't. I think it was a topic that needed a bit of time just to really go over it, so I'm not too upset about it. I hope you guys stuck with it. But, Troy, what are we going to talk about next week? I'll tell you. We're going to talk about computers. Oh, yeah. Computers, what does that have to do with astronomy? <laughs> everything, 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 everything. So yeah, last let's let's we're gonna end the show in three minutes. So ask any questions. Inexpensive magnetic or air bearing, air bearing mounts. That's interesting. Um, I recommend a company out of the Netherlands called Mesu Optics. Um, they make a friction drive that's extremely affordable for what it does. It's not cheap, but it is, in my opinion, a fantastic value. It is, it is stiffer and heavier duty and able to carry a heavier load than much much more expensive mount. That being said, I can tell you a little secret. We're in the process of ordering a direct drive mount, which has no gears, and the uh, that that's uh, made by a company called Plane Wave. And so uh, there are different ways to drive telescopes. And by the way, it didn't come up a lot this week or tonight, although I think Ed brought it up. The gearing is a real problem with these systems because even if you have a well-manufactured mount, the gear teeth intermeshing inconsistently produces an issue known as backlash, where it can move back freely or um, periodic error. The correct way to solve this is by using high resolution encoders and having the motors actively drive out the periodic error. I personally strongly disagree with this quote solution unquote. I think that it's better to not create the problem in the first place. And this is why I'm a big fan of both friction drives, which I mentioned, which use two smooth metal surfaces without gear teeth or direct drive, which have no gear interface whatsoever. So yeah, um, that, by the way, that's, I, I, in my opinion, the future. I think we should get away from gears because they do create these, these artifacts of motion that are difficult to solve without expending lots of money or applying lots of high technology. Uh, you can actually see periodic error very evidently, even in very high quality mounts. We have this one mount that was supposed to be fantastic and it's ended up being a huge disappointment and it produces a lot of periodic error and terrible backlash. Um, and it's, again, a really good one. So yeah, there are... Um, it's hard to solve uh, the issue. And you know, they, you solve it with like grease. You add lots of grease to the gear teeth. And so the grease becomes a sort of friction medium, which I think is absurd. But anyway, I'm not going to start ranting and raving about telescope mount engineering. That is a nerdy topic that very few people find interesting. So I, uh, we'll, we could talk more about that later. Questions, questions. Last, last chance, one minute. Who's direct drive? Uh, I'm doing the plane wave. There's more than one company that makes direct drive, but. They're actually U.S. based, and they're out of Michigan now. They moved. They used to be in California, and they, I think their prices are reasonable. They're not cheap, but they're not crazy either. So, um, yeah, I can't talk about my budget. I don't want to make anyone angry, or sad, <laughs> or both. Yeah. Let me go back to that video. Actually, I'll go back to this classic picture of our telescope when it used to be a classical casting ring. Oh, you know, I forgot to mention. The secondary mirror in the classical Cassegrain design was 10 inches wide. That's a huge obstruction for a 24 and a half inch mirror. And by the way, if I didn't mention it in this show, that's how big our big telescope is. It's 24 and a half inches. The new secondary mirror in the Newtonian design is only six inches. And it could have been even smaller, but we oversized it a bit to make it future proof for giant sensors. Yeah. And a lot of other things too. We made it so that the focal plane could move very far away from the OTA for uh, ergonomic reasons. Because don't forget, we're a public observatory. We want people to be able to climb up and actually look through this darn thing. Yeah. Oh, so Arecibo, what happened to it? Well, it broke. It collapsed under its own weight after over half a century of use. Um, it, it did survive multiple hurricanes. Uh, and the, the question is, are they going to repair it and rebuild it? And, and we don't know. We don't know. Uh, it is. It was, past tense, very important. Uh, there is a larger radio telescope in China now, much bigger actually, called the FAST telescope. Um, 
Uh, but Arecibo still had its value. Uh, for example, Arecibo was not just a receiver, it was also a transmitter and allowed us to do high resolution radar studies of near earth objects like asteroids. So that's something the Chinese telescope can't do. So there is some argument in favor of fixing Arecibo. I, I hope they do it. It's a, it's kind of a treasure that, that, that great radio telescope Arecibo. Yeah. <laughs> not your Troy, but not your budget Troy Parnellas. What? What is the best telescope? Kids learn telescope. Oh, so um, oh, I see, I see. So, uh, so in my opinion, the best telescopes are Newtonians for value, in an alt azimuth cradle known as a Dobsonian. Dobsonian telescopes are a good value, and I recommend a brand called Orion, and they have a very easy website to remember: telescope.com. If you forget that URL, I, I can't help you. So yeah, Dobsonian reflectors, which are Newtonians in an alt azimuth cradle, they're extremely easy to use, and they're the best bang for the buck in terms of aperture versus what you pay for it. By the way, the aperture is very important. The size of a telescope determines how much light it collects and also how much resolution it can generate. Yeah, good question. All right, well, we went over my promise of two minutes. So I hope we learned a few things. Next week, we're going to talk about computer science as it applies to astronomy. I happen to like computers, so maybe I'll, be, I'll have some fun with that. And uh, also, I will uh, encourage you on Tuesday morning, if you get up early enough, to see the conjunction of Saturn and Mercury. Can you mic the eyepiece? Can you mic the eyepiece? What? Why would I put a microphone on the eyepiece? I don't understand. I don't understand what you're talking about. So, sorry, on that note, the confusion abounds. And if you have any unanswered questions, maybe we can cover them next week. So, I appreciate you all tuning in. Oh, and I forgot to mention, thanks for tuning in after we missed the show last week. Because of the weather, I got stuck on my own driveway, and then I found out the observatory hill was completely snowed in and didn't have access to four-wheel drive that could make it uh, across either of those, those obstacles. So, yeah, I couldn't get up to the observatory during the Great Blizzard. Uh, the, amazingly, a week later, the roads are clear. So that's why I'm here doing this show tonight. Thank, again, thanks for your patience. Sorry about that one-week delay. We're not skipping any episodes. We're just moving the whole schedule forward a week. Yeah. So with that, again, thanks for your time. Have a, a safe evening and safe week, and I encourage you to check out Saturn on Tuesday morning. Hope to see you next week. Same time, same place. If you had fun, like and subscribe. See you later.